Welcome to Lecture 2 for BIB 201 Bible Doctrines. This lecture will be an introduction to the topic of bibliology. Let's begin by discussing the two presuppositions an individual must have in order to understand the Bible properly. The first presupposition is that one must believe that God is or that God exists. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. Why? For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. And not only must we believe that God is, but secondly, we must believe that God has revealed himself. The verse continues that we must believe that God exists and we must believe that God will reward those who seek him. Generally, God has revealed himself through nature and through the conscience of man. Specifically, we will learn that he has done this through primarily scripture and the person of Jesus. But this will be discussed more thoroughly in another section. Now that we've discussed the two presuppositions to understanding the Bible, let's move on to Roman numeral 2. What are the contents of the Bible? Firstly, letter A. The Bible is a unified book. It's unified in six specific ways. First, it bears witness to one God. Christianity is a monotheistic religion, meaning we believe in one God. However, we believe that one God has manifested himself in three separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Secondly, the Bible forms one continuous story, the story of redemption. Not only does the Bible bear witness to one God and form one continuous story, the story of redemption, but number three, the Bible also predicts the future. Fourthly, the Bible has a progressive unfolding of truth. This means that God did not reveal everything to us at one time, but did so in a progressive manner all throughout a specific period of time. Fifthly, the Bible also has one plan of redemption. That plan is by faith. That is how we are redeemed. And sixthly and lastly, the Bible has one central thing, the glory of God. The glory of God being the central theme of the Bible can be seen in the person and work of Christ, the salvation of men, and through every single page of our Bible. Now, not only is our Bible a unified book, the Bible is also a library of 66 books divided into two sections. The first section is commonly called the Old Testament. The word testament in Latin means a covenant. This is different from a contract. A contract can be broken when one party fails to meet its requirements, whereas a covenant remains intact no matter what happens. Contracts are typically for business. Covenants are for relationships. Now let's look at the Old Testament. Letter A. The Old Testament consists of 39 books. Letter B, it was mostly written in Hebrew with a few chapters in a language called Aramaic. Then letter C, the Old Testament focuses primarily upon the nation of Israel. Interestingly, letter D, the Jews divide the Old Testament into three sections. The first section is called the Torah. This means the law. Those are the first five books of the Old Testament, commonly called the Pentateuch. Secondly, you have the Nivaim. These are the prophets. And then thirdly, you have the Kitavim, which means writings. Now that we looked at the Old Testament, let's move on to the New Testament. Letter A. The New Testament consists of 27 books. And while the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew with a few sections in Aramaic, letter B, the New Testament was written in Greek. 
Now, I will say that there are some people who believe that the book of Matthew was originally written in Aramaic. However, there is not as much support for this view as there is to believe that it was originally written in Greek. And letter C, while the Old Testament primarily focuses on the people of Israel, the New Testament focuses primarily on the formation and the growth of the church. And letter D, just like the Old Testament is divided into three sections, so is the New. The three sections of the New Testament are number one, the history. Now the history would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And then secondly, you have the epistles. These can be further divided into sections like the general epistles, the Pauline epistles, the prison epistles, etc. And then thirdly, you have the prophecy. That would be the book of Revelation. Not to mention, though, that there are other sections of the New Testament that are prophetic in nature, but the one section that is almost completely and exclusively about prophecy is the book of Revelation. After looking at the two presuppositions to understanding the Bible and the contents of the Bible, let's now look at Roman numeral 3, the canon of Scripture. Letter A. What is the definition of the word canon? Number one, the word canon means measuring rod. Applied to the Bible, canon means those books which have been measured, found satisfactory, and approved as being inspired by God, and considered to be the rule of faith and practice for the church. The word rule, as we find in Galatians 6.16, is the Greek word kanon, where we get the word canon. This means that the Bible is supposed to be the ruler to which we measure ourselves up to, and not people or preferences. Now that we know what the word canon means, let's answer the question, when did the books of the Bible become canonical? Number one, as far as God is concerned, the books of the Bible were canonical when they were written. There's two passages that really allude to this. The first is Joshua chapter 8, verses 33 through 35. In this passage, Joshua accepts Moses' writing as the canon when he reads the law to the people. But not only does Joshua 8, 33 through 35 support this, Secondly, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 does as well. When we read these passages, we can see that Peter recognized Paul's writings as canon, as the rule for the church to follow. Secondly, we need to take note that the canonical books were collected and grouped into one book, but... This was a gradual process. Letter A, the Old Testament canon was completed during the time of Ezra in the 5th century BC. And while we do not know exactly how they decided this or what criteria they used, though one suggestion has just been the author who wrote them, the Jews have always accepted the Old Testament as God's word for them. Just like the previous section we were learning about, there are two passages that we can really look to to determine that the Old Testament was canon during the time of Jesus. The first is Luke chapter 24, verse 44. In this verse, Jesus clearly accepted the Old Testament canon just as we have it today. But not only does Luke 24, 44 support this, secondly, so does 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. In this very familiar verse, we find that Paul accepted the Old Testament canon as such, since that was the accepted, quote, scripture of his time. Interestingly, this would also apply to the New Testament since the last epistle written by anyone other than John the Apostle was Timothy with 2 Timothy.
Now that we know when the Old Testament canon was completed, what about the New Testament? The New Testament canon was completed by A.D. 397 by the Council of Carthage. While the majority of the New Testament was already accepted by this time, the actual 27 books we have today were formally approved then. This was done by an ecclesiastical council in the city of Carthage. They did not introduce anything new. They just solidified the already accepted books of our New Testament today. Underneath this section, number one, an incomplete canon of Marcion was developed in A.D. 140. Though widely accepted by the church, since it was incomplete, many of the other canonical books were not being rightly seen as inspired. And then secondly, the edict of Diocletian in A.D. 303 to burn all sacred books caused the church to realize the urgent need to determine which books were canonical and guard them. And thirdly, it is important to note that the Apocrypha was accepted as helpful literature, but not given the same priority as the 27 books we have today in our New Testament. Now that we've discussed when the New Testament canon was compiled, let's answer the question concerning what principles they used to determine the canonicity of the New Testament. The first test of canonicity was known as the test of apostolicity. Apostolicity means was it written by an apostle or by someone closely associated with an apostle. Examples of this would be the books of Luke, Mark, Acts, because Acts was written by Luke, and the book of Hebrews. And while we do not know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews, we do know that whomever it was, was either an apostle or someone extremely closely associated with an apostle. The second test was the test of content. This answered the question, was the book on spiritual par with other apostolic books? This ruled out the groups known as the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha literally translates as falsely attributed writings. These were books written about biblical characters, but never included in the Jewish literature because they were not written by the people they were talking about. The third test was a test known as universality. Universality answered the question, was the book universally received in the church? This eliminated semi-canonical books such as First Clement, and the Epistle of Barnabas. And the fourth and final test was known as divine inspiration. This answered the question, did the book give evidence of being divinely inspired and did it edify the saints? Now, since I have mentioned several terms that you may have just first heard of, let's move on to letter D. Terms related to canonicity. The first term is the term Old Testament Apocrypha. Letter A. The word Apocrypha literally means something hidden. And letter B. The following represents a list of those books considered apocryphal. These books would be ones like The Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Tobit, Judith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, The Prayer of Azariah, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Baruch, The Letter of Jeremiah, Additions to Esther, 1st and 2nd Esdras, and The Prayer of Manasseh. Now what we should take note of is letter C. Neither Jesus nor any of his apostles accepted these as canonical, and they never reference them in any way. In fact, letter D, Judaism has never accepted the Old Testament Apocrypha as part of their Old Testament canon. Interestingly, these books were rejected as canonical until the Roman 
Catholic Council of Trent in 1546. While the Council of Carthage may appear to have approved these books, commentaries on those councils by Jerome and others show that they only accepted the Apocrypha to be read for ecclesiastical purposes and not inspirational. The verdict of the first four centuries remained the verdict of the Church during all of the Middle Ages until the Council of Trent. In fact, one of the first things the Reformers undertook was to break from ecclesiastical authority, and they did this by replacing the Roman Catholic idea of an infallible Church with a truly infallible Word of God. Now that we've talked about the Old Testament canon, let's look at one of my favorite terms in all of theology. That is number two, homologamina. The word homologamina means acknowledged. These are the indisputable, universally accepted books of the New Testament. This would include every book in the New Testament from Matthew to Philemon plus 1 Peter, and 1 John. But that means there are a few books, seven in fact, that are left out. That brings us to number three. Antilegomena. The word antilegomena means disputed. These are the disputed books of the New Testament. While they were, quote, disputable, they were all eventually accepted as scripture. As I already mentioned, there are seven of these books that were disputable, or antilegomena. The first one was the book of Hebrews. The reason why the book of Hebrews was disputed was because we do not know who wrote it. The second book was the book of James. This book was disputed because of its alleged teaching on justification by works. In fact, even as late as the Reformation, Martin Luther doubted that it should be included in our New Testament canon. The third book that was disputed is the book of 2 Peter. In fact, this book was disputed more than any other New Testament book on account of its dissimilarities with 1 Peter, and with some alleging that it was written after Peter's death. However, the similarities far outweighed the dissimilarities, and the book did have broad support from many individuals such as Origen, Eusebius, Jerome, and Augustine. Fourthly, both 2nd and 3rd John were a part of the Antilegomena. They were disputed for two primary reasons. First, because the author called himself an elder and not an apostle. And secondly, because 2nd and 3rd John were private letters that had limited circulation. However, it was determined that since Peter calls himself an elder in 1st Peter chapter 5 verse 1, and 2nd and 3rd John are extremely similar to 1st John, which was a part of the homologamina, 2nd Peter should be accepted as well. Fifthly is the book of Jude. The book of Jude was disputed because it quotes from the book of Enoch in verses 14 and 15, and possibly the assumption of Moses in verse 9. However, since Paul quoted from pagan poets in Acts 17, 1 Corinthians 15, and Titus 1, it was determined that a quotation of a book not in the scripture is not significantly different from Paul's. In other words, a reference of a portion of a work does not validate the entirety of it. We can quote a person without affirming their entire belief structure. And sixthly and lastly, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was disputed longer than any other New Testament book because of its prophetic nature. However, 
the apostolic fathers embraced it, especially with it being written by John the Apostle. Now that we've discussed the Old Testament Apocrypha, the Homologomena, and the Antilogomena, let's look at number four, the Pseudepigrapha. The word Pseudepigrapha means false writings. There are actually over 280 of these writings, and no church father has ever considered them as legitimate to Scripture. In fact, one writer quoted, They contain exaggerated and mythical religious folklore that abounded in the early days of the church. They were never considered canonical by respectable leaders and are of very questionable value. More than 50 of these writings are on accounts of Christ. The more well-known of these are the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Hebrews, and the Proto-Evangelium of James. And the final term that we should look at is what's known as the New Testament Apocrypha. These were books written after the time of Christ, which were accepted by some in the church. These writings differ from the Pseudepigrapha because some were used and accepted by some churches. They include some of the following, the Epistle of Pseudobarnabas, the Epistle to the Corinthians, the Ancient Homily, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Gospel according to the Hebrews, the Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, and the Seven Epistles of Ignatius. The final topic that we will discuss in this lecture is Roman numeral 4, the translations of the Bible. Let's begin by looking at those considered the ancient translations. Number one is a document called the Septuagint. Letter A. The Septuagint was a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek. And this was done in approximately the 3rd century B.C. The reason why it's called the Septuagint, which means 70, is because, letter B, tradition says that it was done by 70 scholars fluent in Greek and Hebrew. In fact, some even say that it was completed in 70 days. The second ancient document is known as the Vulgate. The Vulgate was a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into Latin. Letter B, it was translated by a man I mentioned several times already named Jerome in around A.D. 400. In fact, this was the standard for the Roman Catholic Church for 1,000 years. Today, they do not exclusively use this, but still do in many liturgical worship services. Now that we've looked at the ancient translations, let's move on to letter B, the English translations. The first one is known as the John Wycliffe Bible. Letter A, this was the first complete English translation in A.D. 1382. However, it had one main fault. It was translated from the Vulgate and not from the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. In spite of that, though, let her see. It was the translation that reached the people and sparked the Reformation. Another English translation was accomplished by a man named William Tyndale. In contrast to the Wycliffe Bible, his Bible was translated from the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, which made it a more accurate translation. This was done in A.D. 1526. It's interesting to take note that the Greek New Testament in which Tyndale used was known as the Erasmus Greek New Testament, also known as the Textus Receptus. Tyndale's translation became the basis for the Matthew Bible, 
This was because Tyndale was martyred before being able to complete his translation of the entire Old Testament. A man by the name of John Rogers, using the pseudonym Thomas Matthew, possibly for fear of falling into the same demise as Tyndale, ended up finishing this work. The third English translation that we will discuss in this lecture is known as the Great Bible. The Great Bible was the first authorized copy of the scriptures in England. It was so because the throne needed to back this translation since the Catholic Church was so vehemently opposed to it that they even put some individuals to death. Letter B. This Bible is called the Great Bible because it was extremely large and chained to reading desks or pulpits in many churches. The fourth and most commonly known English translation of the Bible is known as the Authorized Version, which was accomplished in A.D. 1611. Another name for this version of the English translation is the King James Version. This version was actually the third official translation by the Church of England. The first was the Great Bible, the second was the Bishop's Bible, and the third is the authorized or King James Version of the Bible. However, it should be noted that the King James Version has been revised at least five times. So the one that most people use today is not actually the King James 1611, but more than likely the King James 1769. And fifthly and lastly, because of the efforts of many individuals to get the Word of God into the English-speaking language, there are many other great English versions out there today. That brings us to the end of Lecture 2 for BIB 201 Bible Doctrines 1.